Experiencing the Derwent Valley. One of the reasons for the Derwent Valley Mills being inscribed on UNESCO's World Heritage List is because the beautiful Green Valley setting in which the mills and their communities were built has survived and can still be enjoyed today. Take Belper today. Although the town has grown significantly since the 18th century when the first water-powered cotton mills were built, you can still enjoy a strong sense of that green valley in which they were first inserted. Moving in a little closer, you can see the huge red east mill. Although a part of the town centre, it looks from Christ Chase as if it's surrounded by green trees. And it's not just Belper. The valley is at its most rural and striking in the north, where Masson Mills sit in a narrow ravine and the Arkwright built Willersley Castle and the mill workers community of Cromford cling to the valley sides. One constant feature in the 15 miles of World Heritage Site travelling north to south or vice versa is the River Derwent and its floodplain. Most of the mills would not exist if there was no river, but it brings its own challenges in times of drought or flooding such as here in December 1960. Sadly, not everything has survived from those early days of the Industrial Revolution. The mills here at Milford have long since gone and the quarry on the left has closed and become a children's playground. But Milford's housing for the mill workers has survived and the village has as green a setting as any of the communities along the valley. Returning to Belper, this view, again from 1960, shows that wide green valley setting, this time from the Chevin Ridge in the west. In the distance are the Belper Mills, including the chimney of 1854, the tallest in Britain at the time, and the Jubilee Clock Tower, built atop the West Mill in 1898 to commemorate, a little late, the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. This modern view shows a number of changes. Chimney and Clock Tower have gone, but the East and North Mills have survived. The farm in the foreground looks rather smarter than it did, and the community of Belper has definitely grown, but development hasn't overwhelmed the valley, far from it. It's to be hoped that this will always be the case. Right, let's move in a bit closer. We can wander around through this old community and see some of its heritage. Let's start on the fleet, home of fleet arts and featuring what was Bayard's Field. Now, there's a football pitch at a very steep angle on it, but once, before the trees took over at the top, it was a wonderful vantage point for looking at the town centre, as you can see here in the mid-1890s. Perhaps it's best if I add some labels. In the distance, the mill chimney is hard to miss. To the left of it is the West Mill, but without the clock tower, so it's before 1898. Behind the West Mill, on the other side of the Derwent, is Bridge Hill House, main residence of the Strutt family, who owned the mills. Another Strutt house was Green Hall, on the far right, which stood in King Street. Demolished in 1956, it's now the Green Lane car park. On the far left, is another mill chimney. This belonged to a steam-powered corn mill, Unity Mill, which now houses the Derwentside Antique Centre. The chimney came down nearly 60 years ago. Belper was an industrial powerhouse in the 19th century. As well as the mills and other textile factories, there were nail makers and there were foundries. Two can be seen here on Queen Street in the foreground with big arched entrance and park foundry in the middle where you can see steam or smoke rising. That's now the car park of the co-op supermarket. The foundry moved to the bottom of Bexich Lane at the end of 1899. Right, let's move on. Coming down the slope a little way and coming closer to the road, we come to the site of the old Fleet Well. Long gone now, but when the old tradition of well dressings were briefly revived during the 1960s, a dressing was placed here each year, despite the disappearance of the well. Here's the traditional blessing ceremony, following a procession complete with church choir. Wells were an important part of Belper life once, before the Struts provided pipe water for every home. Next to Bayard's Field is the Parks, the ancient deer park, and within it once there was the Lady Well. This is the earliest and best view of the well on the left-hand side. It was said that the water from the Lady Well was the finest in Belper for making tea, so Victorian groups would often spend afternoons walking through the park to reach the well in order to end the day with the finest cuppa of the week. It was a sad day, in a way, when the well was capped at the end of the century, so the water could be used for the town's new piped supply. Well dressings have been part of Derbyshire life since medieval times in some parts of the county. At Belper, 
They didn't arrive until 1837. Here's a flyer from 1839 advertising one of the early dressings at the Manor Well, also in the parks. They had fireworks as part of the festivities and the flyer included a rather elaborate poem. Well dressings died out at the end of the 19th century and there was increasing rivalry which ended up in groups of men sabotaging each other's dressings in order to win the cash prizes and it all resulted in street brawls. The council decided to put a stop to it. In this mid-20th century view of the parks, you can still see the Lady Well in a gap through the trees. Now it's in the back garden and thoroughly covered over, lost forever. As you pass through the parks, even today you can't miss the little bridge over the Coppice Brook. The little wooden bridge here has been replaced with something rather more substantial from the days when the park was farmed and large equipment needed access. The ford in the foreground has long since disappeared and it's all very heavily wooded now. The deer which once roamed here wouldn't recognise the 21st century version at all. Closing in on the marketplace, we climb up from the little bridge, which you can just about make out in the centre of this photograph, and head up to the coppice, now a car park off the marketplace. In this 1983 view, you can see there were far fewer trees than now, and Bayard's Field can be clearly seen in the distance, with the houses of the fleet behind. This is an old illustration of Belper Marketplace from before the days of photography. You can see that originally this was the village green. By 1881 it had become a muddy mess from overuse, so George Henry Strutt had it paved over. Bottom right is the Black Swan, which is still a public house today. Left of it you can see the toll chain, preventing carts and carriages heading down King Street, bottom left, until money had been given to use this turnpike road. At the very back is the Old Angel Inn, and in front of it a tree, believed to be the tree under which John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, preached to the people of the town on July the 5th, 1786. Once the marketplace had been paved by the Struts, the people of the town raised money by public subscription to place a memorial on the new stone flags, thanking them for their generosity towards the town. Here it is being installed. The plan was for it to have drinking water pouring from two lion's heads into stone bowls below, but for one reason or another, it wasn't plumbed in. It's still dry today. At the end of the First World War, before a permanent cenotaph for Belper's dead had been agreed on and built in the memorial gardens, this temporary structure was built around the 1881 memorial. On the 27th of September 1919, 6,000 people filed past this spot to pay their respects to the fallen. Once you're over the Pelican Crossing, immediately in front of you is Eight Marketplace, now home to the prestige Beauty Salon. For many years, this was a chemist with a fine frontage, as you can see. Heading down King Street, the main shopping street, on the right is this building. Constructed in 1956, this was the cooperative department store, initially, and a very different building to anything Belper had seen before. It was very modern for its time, even boasting its own lift. Further down King Street, there's a small channel running down the side of the Poundland shop. Before 1973, there was no Poundland, and this was the entrance to the town station. The card shop was a greengrocer's in those days, and there was a matching range of shops on the opposite side of the entrance. Beyond the iron gates is the ticket office, and past which were the ramps down to the platforms. If you were heading south, after the ticket office, you needed to cross the footbridge to reach the right platform. If a steam train came in while you were on the bridge, there was no protection from the smoke as it billowed through those open slats. From the footbridge, you had a perfect spot for seeing both platforms. This photograph was taken shortly after this station opened in 1878. There were two waiting rooms on each platform, one for women and children, the other for men. Expressers stopped here in those days, so the platform stretched out as far as the Field Lane Bridge. Even from this distance, the mill chimney stands out on the horizon to the left. The southbound platform bank was decorated with this rockery spelling out the word Belper. This was the full contingent of staff in those early days, eight men plus one boy selling matches, chocolate and other sundries to travellers as they stopped briefly in Belper and pulled down their window to buy supplies. From the southbound platform, steps and a channel take you through to Albert Street. 
This was once the festival field where the people of Belper witnessed the town's first hot air balloon experience. You can't call it a ride as the balloon refused to rise while the owner was in the basket and it was only as he stepped out and realised no one was holding on that it suddenly shot in the air and drifted off over the valley. The owner had to borrow a horse to chase after it, catching it up before it reached Ashbourne. At the end of Albert Street, as you look back, you'll see a view much like this, although the old Unity Corn Mill in the distance lost its chimney over 50 years ago. Turning left, let's walk along Green Lane for a while. This is the road's third name. It was Meeting House Lane in the late 18th and early 19th century, with the old Unitarian Meeting House at the south end. Then, it was Market Street Lane, becoming Green Lane by 1898. On the left, this chapel once stood facing St Peter's Churchyard. It was the Salem Chapel of 1856, dismantled shortly after this photograph was taken in 1965. At the end of Green Lane, you turn into Long Row, Belper's finest historic street, with this stunning terrace of three-storey stone-built houses for the mill workers, built in the 1790s and only split by the demolition of some houses in 1838 to get the railway through. On the right, you can see they're loading Mazza's ice cream van. For 45 years until 1992, there was an ice cream factory at the top of the street. You can just see a corner of it on the very far right. Coronation year, 1937, and Long Row was festooned with bunting for the crowning of King George VI. Long Row was always winning Best Dressed Street Awards in those days, partly because the terraces were perfect for hanging out the bunting and flags. The railings in front of each house on the right were all removed as part of the war effort just a few years later. At the bottom of Long Row, you reach the Triangle, a perfect spot for viewing the mills. The gangway footbridge crossing over the road has linked the two sides of the mill complex since 1795. On the west side, on the left here, you can see the round mill, a remarkable construction of William Strutt's, which was one of the first casualties when the English Sewing Cotton Company decided to sweep away those buildings it didn't need. It collapsed during demolition, killing four workmen. A terrible tragedy for the town in December 1959. Behind it is the Jubilee clock tower we saw earlier. Passing under the gangway and looking beyond the river bridge, you can see Bridge Hill. Once, from the 1790s, you'd have seen Bridge Hill House, the Strutt's main residence in the town, poking over the trees. After the death of Herbert Strutt in 1928, crippling death duties forced the family to abandon Bridge Hill House and it was eventually demolished and new housing peppered the hillside instead. Here are some of those new houses in 1968. Turning back to the mill, you can see on the right what the West Mill looked like before the Jubilee Clock Tower was built. Smaller clock faces were attached to each gable. Returning to the gangway, on the right, you'd have passed the covered walkway over the mill leat, leading into the West Mill. Through the railings in those days, you'd see the deep swirling black waters just inches away. They gave many a child nightmares, we're told. We're heading to the River Gardens now, but first, let's have a little look at Belper's stunning horseshoe weir, built in 1797 to hold back sufficient water to power the entire mill complex. There were 11 water wheels on site at one time. Here it is during the big freeze of January 1963, when the Derwent above and the weir basin below were completely frozen over. Arriving in the river gardens on the other side of the mill complex, during much of the early 20th century, you'd have descended down a ramp from Matlock Road, arriving at this rustic footbridge which brought you onto the main site. In this old mill leet, these rockery islands were created using artificial stone called pulamite to create interest for visitors. Once in the grounds, having paid your sixpence entry fee, there was a chance to promenade. From this photograph taken from the roof of the boathouse, you can see that everyone is heading in the same direction, walking up to the bandstand, continuing to the tea rooms in the distance, then walking back along the side of the river before repeating the process. No one seems to be disrupting this pattern. It's a very orderly day out. Concerts in the river gardens were hugely popular. Initially, there was just a platform for bands to perform on, but they were so successful that a proper bandstand was built less than a year later. 
Here's the Royal Engineers Band performing to a packed river gardens. Note the gas lamps connected to the bandstand, allowing bands to play until darkness fell and the firework displays began for special celebrations. By the water, there was originally no promenade, just an area of decking. In July 1905, there were no gardens, no paths, no tea house, but a water gala was held with decorated boats, like this Japanese pagoda seen here on the right. It proved so popular that 2,500 people turned out for it and it was the success of this event that convinced Herbert Strutt to turn these marshy osier beds into a proper visitor destination for the people of the town but also many others. Within three years bank holidays attracted up to 8,000 people to this pretty but tiny park. At the far end of the gardens were the Swiss tea rooms. In their first year, 1906, there was a thatched heather roof providing the most picturesque of scenes. Unfortunately, it leaked badly and a new waterproof roof was added later that year. Beyond the tea rooms was the railway bridge, where steam trains broke out of the deep, mile and a half long Belper cutting and immediately crossed over the River Derwent, allowing passengers to see the river gardens and the cottages of Wyver Lane on the far bank. The original railway bridge looks so flimsy to us now and it was replaced in 1933. And here ends our jaunt through Belper. I hope you enjoyed it.